30 years. Uh, please welcome Joe Mandisi. Thank you, Steve. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, over the years, I've also stu studied a little bit about television. It was the first medium I covered when I worked for Ad Week back in the early 80s. And uh, in some ways, I feel like a lot of things we're talking about today, we were talking about back then. Uh, I just want to open with one personal anecdote, which is I'm always shocked at how badly technologies we write about don't actually sometimes work from a consumer perspective. So in my household, the Oscars are like the Super Bowl. And um, somehow I planned the flight in here last night, forgetting that it was Oscar night. So my wife's a little angry at me. But I figured, oh, no problem. I'll just live stream it, right? I mean, there's 8 million ways from Sunday that you could do this. And I failed. I mean, it was just a terrible experience because um, I pre-downloaded the ABC to go down uh, app, uh, you know, did everything I thought I could to prepare. I got on the flight. And what happens is they try and geolocate you, you know, so they can assign it to your local carrier. <laughs> and that won't work when you're 40,000 feet up. I downloaded, uh, I tried Pluto TV, but the sticker shock of putting your credit card in for like $50 just to sign up was too much. I downloaded YouTube TV because it was seamless into my Gmail and Google account. Um, I have five days to cancel it. But <laughs> data lives forever. none of it worked. Well, data lives forever. The first thing I noticed when I opened the YouTube TV app, if any of you have done it, is there's a little tab in there for Nielsen ratings. I mean, it's just embedded in. Anyway, that's my personal anecdote of a fail. Um, <laughs> So I'm excited to, uh, to do this panel. Um, why don't we just uh, have each of you just open up by uh, introducing yourself and describing your organization and specifically, like to the extent you can, how, do you, how are you organized right now to plan across screens? Mm -hmm. Linear to OTT to connected to YouTube. <laughs> uh, Matt Siri, Havas Media, uh, which is actually a combination of the old MPG and media contacts, so you had a traditional and a more digital agency that we're, we're built from. Um, how we plan, uh, it actually depends on client group to client group, but mostly uh, we have our TV and our video investments group that is guided by the generic, let's call it the planning team for lack of a better term, um, in terms of the optimizations and then the video investment team goes to market from everything from linear to programmatic to addressable. Uh, Adrian Holthouse, I'm from Exveris Media. Uh, we're a small, scrappy agency out of LA, and uh, it was actually bred by folks that were with larger agencies and didn't really like the model and thought it might be a lot of fun to come together and work with some challenger brands. So when it comes to planning uh, video across screens, we are an organization that is dedicated to bringing on integrated planners from top to bottom. So if you don't have experience across a variety of mediums, it doesn't necessarily make sense for us as an agency and the clients that we're buying for. We also bring on subject matter experts in different areas. So for example, we'll have a YouTube and search expert, social media subject matter experts and things like that to help support the overarching strategy for a client when we're planning across mediums. Hi, I'm Ryan Mearstein with Targeted Victory, and uh, I'm one of those guys that was driving up CPMs last fall in the political <laughs> space. Uh, you know, just a little context, you know, what, you know, I'm going to try to speak with perspective from the political space and kind of what we saw in 2018 and how that drives how we're set up at Targeted Victory. And, you know, nine out of ten times kind of what we're seeing in the political space is a bifurcation where you've got... Uh, when it comes to video, linear, linear TV, and then everything else. And, and so we kind of sit in that everything else category at Targeted Victory. And, you know, in, in that space, we, we, we try to be screen agnostic and develop ways to scale as much as possible against first party data, which our political campaigns are dumping incredible amount of resources into. Okay, so it sounds like um, some different variations here. It sounds like Havas has a pretty traditional hierarchical approach to television slash video. And then you're more of a comms planning or strategic approach. And then you have a very specific tactical use, uh, finding the data and assigning it to the viewer. And um, So three different mixes. Um, so I'd like to get into next is really thinking about whether the industry even um, thinks about structuring television and video the way consumers actually experience it today. Um, 
you know, there was just a Havas study that came out uh, this week we reported on, on the number of brands in the world and the fact that only like 23% of them are even relevant to the average consumer. And I'm citing that because there's no better category to show the fragmentation, proliferation of choice than video. Um, about 20 years ago, the first generation of programmatic started when agencies adoptimized adopted these audience reach optimizers. And the reason they did that back in the mid 90s is because there was just too many options for a media planner or a buyer to plan anymore. They had to rely on a programmatic or algorithmic approach to assigning reach. And everything's been a progression from there. So my question is, if you had to like rethink this and reinvent it, would you plan and buy media the way we do, television in particular, the way we do today? Well, we like to take an audience-based approach to our media buying. So for us, a lot of it starts with taking a look at who is that, who it is we're trying to reach. So we're using tools like MRI, for example. And it has a lot of really great traditional TV data, but it's now starting to add some of these other services. So now we can not only take a look at what the consumption is, where the higher indexes are, but there's also those psychographic statements then that you can layer on top and really figure out some of the in more intelligent and unique channels that maybe you wouldn't have done before. So once again, we're taking that integrated approach. And it was interesting listening to the EA presentation and a lot of those cultural moments as well. So we truly do believe there is a place for linear, um, but taking advantage when it makes sense for clients and campaigns and brands, those really interesting tentpole or cultural moments to release that content. Uh, I would say yes. I would still approach it in a similar way from the 90s. Um, I'm a Erwin Efren acolyte. Acolyte, that's not how you say it. Um, rest in peace, buddy. The, the, the tenets of recency theory and, and, freak, and continuity are still in play. How you get that maximized reach is a vastly different uh, approach than where we were before. Um, at Havas, what we do, the reason why we have a lot of our traditional planners do a lot of the optimizations is that they have the overset over linear and how programmatic can help you expand that reach and how online video can play in that space and then factoring in all, you know, uh, the CPMs and viewability and things like that. Um, ultimately, those do go into a holistic optimizer so you can maximize your reach. I work on a lot of CPG brands, so reach and, and is, is king there. Um, I was one of the, the quotes up uh, earlier in the presentations where, you know, those tools need to get better. Um, you, you can plug in a YouTube in there and, and just intuitively the reach contribution doesn't necessarily make sense in, within the broader landscape, but we're getting there and we're getting better. Um, but in, I would say the, the core tenets of how we started doing it in the 90s still hold true with, um, let's say, some tweaks depending on the, on the tactic. Okay, so I think we have three very different, actually two very different types of uh, planner buyers here. So you come at it from a very traditional hierarchical approach, and you're coming at it from it's the data stupid, <laughs> find the, um, where the consumers are and buy the media that's right for them. I want to come back and challenge you a little bit, Ryan, because, um, I'm sorry, Matt, because the concept of, it feels like there's a little bit of legacy in this still. Yes, I was there when Erwin Efren um, coined recency, and the reason he explained that we needed optimizers back then was there was just too many options. He actually had a number, it was like 4.7 quadrillion options that you could plan and buy with media. But the problem really starts with the fact that you're starting with television, that you have to put the base buy down. The whole way the system and the industry works, you know, from the upfront, you know, where you're actually forced to move in a market before budgets are even set for the year, things like that. I don't want to go rhyme and verse on that, but I think more than anybody on this panel, I'd like to hear from you whether you think this should be reinvented or it's just that you're Havas and WPP <laughs> and uh, Group, you know, Group M and Interpublic all are moving battleships and you still need to get the base buys down and then fill in strategically, tactically to target audiences from there. So I. I I'm not totally, I don't, I don't know if we're aligned there. We, when we're doing video optimizations, linear is, a, or traditional is a part of that. Um, one of my clients is a, a vitamins company. They tend to be a little bit older, 
focused um, in their targeting, so linear is going to be a bigger mix of that. If I had cool brands like video games to work on, I'm sure over the top addressable programmatic would be a much larger piece of that. Um, I would say we go in platform agnostic, and that's a core tenet of actually of Havas, in our video planning to see where the audiences are, and then we optimize to maximize reach according to that audience. Now it's interesting with our optimizers today, a lot of them, um, it's, it's hard to get beyond some of the core demographics. I would love to have an optimizer that said, okay, um, 18 to 34 year olds that play soccer video games, and then we can optimize against that target. Not quite sure we're there yet. Okay, well, um, I'm gonna still try and reinvent the wheel if we can a little bit here. But um, let's look at it a little differently, which is if it's really a consumer-centric approach to media, um, shouldn't you really be targeting and identifying the audience you want to reach, agnostic of how you would reach them in the marketplace, and then figure out the best way to reach them in the marketplace? And it, I guess the weight here is that um, it has to be an audio-video message. That's the common hook across all these connected screens and OTT and TV. Because um, I was struck by the guy from Spotify getting his message in here, but to me, it's it's about reaching the audience and then figuring out what the right format is. Um, so, do we have this kind of a backwards a little bit in the sense that um, shouldn't we be looking at? Um, I'd like to hear maybe a little bit more from you because you have a very strategic yeah. but also tactical approach to building up an audience. Yeah, and you know, like I said in the opening, you know, we we have these silos between linear television and kind of everything else. Uh, but I guess the good news on that front is we do have the same data that is informing each of those silos. Uh, and we do have good coordination across uh, creative within each of those silos. But I think it's important in the political space to understand the business model and the success proposition that we have to live under. And I think those two things allow legacy strategies to stay around a lot longer than they probably should um, because, you know, I don't know that I believe it's still a good idea to be buying 1,000 to 1,500 points a week on linear television, but we're doing it. And it's because we have the money then and we have a little time then and that's when people are paying attention. Um, but, you know, we also have a business model or a success proposition where if we get 49% of the market, we are losers. Where like other people in here might get 49% of the market and be billionaires. Uh, and so it is, a, it is very tough to, when we're, we're, we're in a cycle of only every two years, it is very tough to say that we are going to change the model because other folks are seeing this and test this through you know, the fall of 2020 when we know something else has worked in the past. And so it creates a pretty difficult situation and allows legacy items to stay around longer than they should. Yeah, I'm shocked in a category as, as vertical as political that so much of the weight still goes into TV as the base, but um, isn't a lot of that the campaigns and the candidates that there's a legacy there, they expect that and... Um, you have the donors as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> we, are, we are, we, all of our, our funding, you know, comes from from donors and a lot of them want to see a really fancy television commercial on TV. And, and so uh, I, I do think we are, we are making great strides and getting much better in our media mix. Uh, and you know, I was talking to Ben about that earlier and I think, I think he'll probably reiterate that as well. We are, we are definitely moving in the right direction. I think like four years ago, you would have heard a lot of complaining on the political side about like digital being left right. behind. Uh, I think we are, we are definitely moving in the right direction. Yeah, I'd say culture is the number one thing I've observed in this industry. Uh, of things changing or not changing. And, um, you know, in, in this case, I think there's a, a huge bias towards tr conventional linear TV thinking. But I was struck when Colleen did her little Lumiscape chart, you know, all those different options on there. And one of the ones I didn't see was actually um, live video game playing, uh, which to me is a whole other video medium, things like Twitch. And it's huge. And if you want to target young millennials, in particular males, I think, um, that's where you need to be to get them. So um, I guess on that frame, do we have the right cultural mindset to understand how to use video properly when it's all of these discrete audiences experiencing things and obviously not in flight watching the Oscars, but you know, all these different ways. I mean, AMC did a presentation about 10 years ago at a TV critics tour 
and figured out there was more original hours of TV program being produced than human beings could watch. And so all those things that you were recording on your hard drive, on your DVR, wherever, you may never ever get to because there's more content coming. That was 10 years ago. So if you put things like Twitch into the mix, I don't think you could even get an Erwin Efren optimizer to come up with an effective reach plan now. I don't know. If anyone could invent that, they'd be a rich person, right? <laughs> It's true. You, you do, you know, clients have the, these requirements around their reach and frequency, but it is a challenge because it is so fragmented. So does that RNF make sense on the same RNF that you're running for linear? Does it make sense when you're running on YouTube and when you're running on Hulu and so on and so forth? It's really tricky to, to make some sort of a unified model. Where do they come from? I mean, in the old days, um, there would be these Nielsen Cumes done every decade or so and people would benchmark an effective frequency of three or whatever and that's how it all got done. Where are they being, where are they coming from today? When we do a lot of our, our video uh, optimizations, we're, there are, it's, it is difficult. Sometimes you can pull from a market AMX model. Those are typically based on GRPs. Uh, a lot of times we'll try to see the inflection point where reach maxes out and you're building more frequency. Um, so that's, there aren't any real solid hard and fast mm -hmm. rules. Um, to go back a minute or two ago though, I think you know, when we first started with reach optimizers, we had this one pure fuel of Nielsen data, right? So you could, you could essentially optimize across your universe. The problem now is that there's so many data streams out there with your target. Um, you know, Nielsen TAR is, is able to somewhat bring that together, but the more we're able to pipe that in a unified set, um, the better we'll be able to start optimizing against these channels. The problem is it's not like we're going from just linear TV to linear TV and YouTube, right? It's linear TV, YouTube, and a bazillion other video outlets out there, and then you layer it on the data. It's, it, the fragmentation of it is really what's holding back our optimizers. Well, that was kind of what I was trying to get at before, which is that there's still this front-end logic of planning a base by and reach and frequency, and then all the optimizations done on the back end through attribution or multi-screen or multi-touch attribution or, or regression models to see what worked and what didn't. Why do we still plan the same way we did 20, 30, 40 years ago? I don't want to hug, hug, take up all the hot air up here. Um, you know, we, we optimize in a similar fashion because that's, you know, it, it's based on the limitations of some of our optimizers. A lot of the things like Nielsen Tar, we're actually looking on the back end to see how well we did, and then using that to feed into the future optimizations. Same, we use a, a concentric modeling to take a look at things and see how they performed, but you know, it is a little bit backward looking to a degree because you, you are looking at something not while it's active and in flight, you're looking at something after the fact to determine effectiveness to then inform how you're going to plan in the future. To date, I haven't seen any really strong tools that allow me to do in-flight optimization to the degree where I would want it to because every channel has a different approach to measurement and the types of attribution that you can apply. So there is no simple approach to it, and I think because there isn't, people can kind of get a little bit stalled by it. Now, I, I think it's just also a perception thing. We believe there's supposed to be a TV planner, a digital planner, a mobile planner, whatever it is, and that, that's how we believe the world works, and so that's how we plan. Now you, you'd need organizing principles for sure, <laughs> otherwise it would be crazy, right? Um, yeah, I would love to geek out on that kind of data and um, weighting scheme, but I think we're gonna have a panel tomorrow that goes into that, and I, I think the room can probably only take so much of that dive, but. Um, so, none of you really answered my question of whether we, should re re <laughs> whether we should reinvent this in some way and what it should be. How about once, once we can make a big jump in data streams, then we'll reinvent the optimizers? or if we can make some sort of a unified approach to how the planning and buying is done. Is it GRPs? Is it TRPs? Is it impressions? Is it this? Is it that? It's all over the map. And right. because there's nothing that's unified, it is a little antiquated. But I will say that I think no matter what, consumers are going to chase good content, regardless of the device that it's on. And whether it's a one-to-many platform or a one-to-one -one platform, it's really the content that's, that's wagging the tail. 
Well, you still have the core kernel or the denominator of the GRP and the CPM, but around that you can always create any kind of guarantee or end-to-end -end delivery. Um, there have been performance-based buys, I'm sure Havas and all of you have done some of them. We just wrote a story recently about Horizon Media who did a cost per channel turn for a TV client. Um, so you can, you can put anything into the contract and the guarantee and the delivery if you can measure it. The rest is confidence, right? It's having the confidence to do it. But um, it still seems to me like we're coming at it from this GRP mentality. And I, I'm having a hard time. I'm struggling with it because, you know, I grew up covering television and media. And when I started covering digital, I didn't understand why there was no universe estimate for digital. Um, you know, they buy uniques. And uh, I would ask them, like, so what's the share of uniques? And they look at me like I have two heads on um, <laughs> my shoulders. But um, so we're trying to retrofit these two worlds where you're getting a sh literal share of a supply, a finite supply of something to something that's like infinite. And I don't really understand how you reconcile those two things. It seems like you either do it in the front end to get your base logic or linear TV or your campaign by, and then you're doing this stuff on the back end to optimize against the delivery or performance or voter or whatever. Um, that seems like a very confused marketplace to me. <laughs> um, well, maybe we'll turn over to some questions and I'll come back and try and get an answer to that. Um, Christine at Kramer Crassel. Um, I think I kind of agree with what's happening is we just, we do not have a defined universe size. If you could find one that stemmed between both linear and video, then maybe we'd have a better way to find right. planning tools and a better way to plan across all of the devices. I think once that can be developed, and if it's ever developed, like Matt said, um, maybe then we can finally work all together and have one planning team doing all of it. Until that happens, it might be still, we have to work kind of siloed and then find back end ways to make it all work. Does Kramer Chrysalt still handle master lock? No. No? Okay. <laughs> For years you guys For would. Years. Yeah, okay. I think we did more about the creative. Yeah, and the amazing Super Bowl commercials. Yeah. Um, well, that's a great question. Um, you know, a while back, we, we tried to create some kind of universe estimate for digital at Media Post, working with a company called JumpShot. I think it's still live, but basically what we did is um, we created a panel of digital users and we tracked the, their usage levels each day. So it was like a hut or a putt for digital, uh, but nobody ever did anything with it, so we, I think we stopped promoting it. So um, I don't know what a better way would be to build um, you know, a universe estimate, but it, I would think it would have to be user up in some way. Um, when you go into the market for a political campaign, you're thinking of the universe of um, registered voters, Democrats, Republicans, independents, to target your dollars. Um, that's your universe, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have to retrofit in and say, how much of this Nielsen universe can you obtain that way? And then you go into the, um, nonlinear portions of it to figure out how you can fill in for that. Is that kind of the way it works? Yeah, so, I mean, we're working with, you know, on the political side, we're spending millions and millions of dollars on curating these voter files and uh, bringing massive amounts of commercial data in with the voter files that we are collecting from individual secretary of states, counties, wh wh however it works at the state-by-state -state basis. It's an uh, incredibly arduous process. Uh, and, you know, entire firms are built around just managing these voter files. And so that is our base currency for our audiences. Um, and so the linear guys are working to optimize their buys based on that, that voter file audience that we have deemed our persuasion audience, our turnout audience, uh, or whatever it may be. And then on digital, we are working with uh, Google, Facebook, the live ramps of the world to bring as much of that into the space as possible and deliver as much of that uh, against that first party data as we can 
and then figure out how do we scale beyond that when that scale ends. So, so I guess the big question in all, all this is how do you kind of avoid duplication if you're targeting this audience? You have a good census or um, universe estimate for who the target is. Um, how do you know when you're um, getting incremental reach or duplication? So we, we do not try to avoid duplication. We try to moderate against it. There, there is no avoiding it, uh, and especially because we are trying to cram so much money into the media spend in such a small amount of time. Uh, so we try to, as best as possible, write a plan that hedges against that across, you know, if I'm looking at three different silos, Google, Facebook, programmatic, uh, and then plan accordingly through that. But there is no avoiding it. <laughs> okay. All right. So it, it feel, still feels to me like we're, um, we have two different worlds here really kind of approaching this, one coming at it from more of a TV-centric um, baseline and another coming at it from a, kind of a consumer orientation and then filling in how much of the weight should go into TV and other options. Um, do you think overall we're moving as an industry away from, um, you know, historic view of TV values into more of a performance or conversion or maybe a commerce model? And is that a good thing? Yes, I think, I think we are. And yes, I do think it's a good thing. Um, I think if, you know, the first ones that come out with that ability to have really strong shoppable advertising experiences where it warrants it, I think are going to definitely lead the charge in those areas when you've kind of lead, that's the, to me, that's one of the largest proofs of that return on ad spend is if someone's watching my commercial that I've planned for my CPG client on an OTT device and then they're from there actually making a purchase directly in that moment. I mean, that's the win-win ultimately. Right. Do any of you have direct-to-consumer brands that are doing that right now? We have uh, one brand that we plan for that's actually, I can't let the cat out of the bag, but that's actually releasing that technology on their platform very soon. And when that happens, it's going to be amazing. I would say, and again, we, I, I don't want to mischaracterize, we don't plan TV first and everything else. It's a, it's a video agnostic approach to it. Um, until we can get our attribution correct, and even you know, the best marketing mix modeling isn't perfect, it's, it's difficult to assign you know, anything beyond a delivery cost mechanism to, um, to, in, to investments, right? Because you can say it's based on a cost per conversion in your video plan, but there could be seven other different reasons why you have that conversion. Um, so let's hopefully get the measurement right of the audiences. We won't even talk about frequency because even within platforms, that's a very difficult thing to monitor. And some brands, if I see, you know, X commercial on, you know, the same sports over the top view, I might, you know, go crazy. Um, once we get those more basic pieces down, then I feel like we have license to go drive a cost per conversion model off of your video plan. So would that be a good thing from Havas's point of view? I think any agency's point of view, because then you know it solves a lot of the remuneration issues and things like that. Okay, so uh, as soon as we can, we will move to a performance-based TV planning approach. Uh, that, for me, that would be great. Okay, and we don't care about upper funnel as much. I wouldn't say that. You know, you still. It, it, it depends on the metric that you're client is looking after, right? If you are a very DTC, you, you, you started with DTC, so if you're a Razor Club or something like that, sure, it's, um, you know, cost per, per unit sold. For brands that are a bit more awareness driving, you know, that's their KPI, so that's the way they should be structuring or maybe would want to structure their video plan. Yeah, we're in a funny time because we have a lot of these direct-to-consumer brands present at these conferences and within their own little wall garden, they do a pretty good job of optimizing. They may not be using as much channels, although they tend to move into TV, traditional TV, as soon as they can get to the scale. Uh, but then you have companies like Kraft Heinz, you know, one of the great television brands of all time who are now beleaguered and maybe, you know, being challenged um, because that model doesn't work as well as it used to. Um, 
So do you see any um, hope for brands like that who were reliant on mass dispersion, reach building, um, advertising to build awareness and differentiation, uh, competing in this world of hyper backend performance? I think there's opportunity there. I think one of the challenges that comes around is the lack of wanting to share data back with those that could really use it. I so, heard that from EA. She didn't <clears throat> want to share her, her data. <laughs> so if the information sharing is a little bit more fluid, then I think there could be a lot of really great opportunity there. Um, having worked on performance brands in the past, like the Guthy Ranker portfolio, they were very wonderful and open in sharing that back and forth because that's what drives their business. But then you'll have others that are a little bit more closed on that policy. And they're starting to build what we're starting to see too is a lot of insights and analytics teams starting to grow and being built within all of our client direct relationships as well. So we're hoping that that data isn't then just going to be internalized, that it will be surfaced so that we are again working hand in hand with them and leveraging the data that makes sense to drive their results for them. I mean, you mentioned Gunther Rinker. I mean, this is not new. TV has always done direct response and home shopping and all those good things. I guess the thing that's different now is you have more data and more precision um, in terms of tracking it end to end. Um, so that's what's driving it, basically. Um, so I, I wonder, are we ever going to lose the luster of television as an experience, you know, the upfront, the... <laughs> unlimited shrimps at the Lincoln Center, <laughs> things like that. Um, Nothing can replace that. <laughs> but it seems like, um, you know, I, I talked about the Oscars or, you know, live sports events. Those seem to be the big tent poles now. Um, do you think the culture will shift at any point? I think as long as good content is still being produced, I think there will be a place for that. It's interesting to see how some of the traditional TV upfronts are also changing. In, in for ABC, for example, they have digital is a must-have presence there. So I think they're just going to need to evolve as opposed to being the way that maybe they were in the past. And you know the new fronts that are happening now for digital. So the new fronts came to the West Coast this past year. So that was exciting. So if these kinds of trends continue, where it's, again, still focusing around the content and that consumer experience, I think they still will thrive. I think it's already changing. I mean, there's massive brands with huge marketing budgets that could care less about the upfronts that are doing awesome things in DTC and other places. And so it, it is changing. I, I know it's easy for us to concentrate on the upfronts when they come around and, and the big brands that drive this country are, are still participating, but they're, it, it's already gone. And I would say outside of the unlimited shrimp, um, <laughs> you see, if you want to talk about uh, societal events that you aggregate around, I know there was discussion if you know, those are important or not with, with, in terms of reach and marketing. Look at what Netflix is doing. You, you know, they're putting out their shows and contextual right times and things like that. Put aside the fact that you can't advertise there, they are capturing cultural zeitgeist and you know, you might watch it now or later, but the, the content that's really sparking consumer interest is something like a Stranger Things. People are aggregating around it. However, they're watching Netflix. There's eight ways to Sunday to, to get your stream. But that content, in, as you can see throughout the industry, is what's aggregating people. So in a, in a true democratic fashion, any, the best content is going to win. And then we have to see if that's going to be ad supported or not. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. It's not new. We had HBO back in the day. It's still around. But, you know, everybody took bets on when HBO would accept advertising. It still does not. Netflix still doesn't. You have Hulu. You have a lot of subscription video on demand ser services. Um, it looks to me like the tide is moving more towards consumer-supported media. We did an analysis with um, uh, PQ Media recently, which estimated the average American now spends $285 a month on media subscriptions, and that's everything. Um, but that's a lot of money. Um, on the other side, it's contracting your reach through high quality video content to the consumer. Uh, is there an existential problem here? There's still a lot of video content out there. Um, interestingly, 
there is a vast dispersion in CPMs in the marketplace, and that's starting to reflect, I don't want to say quality because it's a very uh, subjective term, but perhaps um, when you get down to the viewability of it and, and all that sort of stuff, the the more engaging video that's out there, but there's still, you know, the, the, the good stuff is still constrained in terms of supply, but there is a long tail of other video content out there. Yeah, I'm always fascinated with that word premium. We're, we're gonna drop a survey soon to see what people mean by that, but uh, any more questions from the audience on uh, where does TV slash connected slash OTT sit in the plan and how does it build up? Oh, it's Brennan from DataZoo. Um, do you guys use ACR data in your planning? So we have used ACR data in the past, yes, and I think that it is something that we would continue to use in the future. We're also, um, you know, to the best of our ability, doing a lot of competitive conquesting using, using that listening technology. You know, if you are, for example, watching family-oriented programming and we can recognize that in your set-top box, we can then competitively conquest you with another service uh, or product, whatever the case may be. So yes, I think some of those interesting technologies definitely have a place. Since I signed up for YouTube TV, I think I'm using it right now. I think it's <laughs> recording everything we're hearing. Adrian, I wanted to pick up on something you had said earlier about that you have, for certain campaigns, you have uh, channel experts. Yeah. And I'm curious, if maybe all of you could address this, about the, this question of expertise within the agency and, who, and whether that expertise is now being spread across channels or if you really are having sort of domain or channel expertise and, and how that's organized, how you're talking to each other about um, whether there are, there, is there a YouTube champion? Is there an OTT champion? Is there a linear TV champion? How they're actually talking to each other and, and sort of talking about their media. So within our organization, what's nice is because of the integrated planning approach to things, we have people that are streaming across all sides. But for the folks that do have a more traditional television background from the start, whether they like it or not, I'll say, is we are immersing them in as much education as possible about all things digital, not just OTT, not just video, everything, social media, content and influencers, search, the whole gamut, because the more they understand about the funnel from top to bottom, the more effective we believe they're going to be when they're planning at the top. So we have a bit of an academic approach to that 60-40 split between upper and lower funnel. Again, it can vary depending on the campaign and the client, but for the most part, that's where we're looking. So we are bringing in different publishers and different vendors in the tech space and everything else to really educate. And when we do a lunch and learn, it's an open forum. Anybody and everybody across the agency is welcome to come. It doesn't have to be the planning discipline that you're in. Yeah, for us, I think, you know, I really like the word you use, champion, as opposed to expert. I think that's how we kind of try to set our teams up, that we have a champion of certain platforms, uh, but everybody is immersed in everything and needs to at least be able to place media on all of them. And our, our video investments team is really a center of excellence, knowing what capabilities are out there. Um, I think from a more strategic perspective, it depends on the client and what they're more focused on. For a more CPG client, that team might be a little bit more versed in what's out there linearly. Um, with a, a hotel's client, they might be more focused in the addressable space, but that's more of an experiential rather than a, a, a focus. And that's, you know, as we start to integrate teams, you know, moving people from account to account, you get that cross-pollination of, of knowledge. Uh, hi, Kevin from ATN. Um, what's the strategy that you implement? You know, consumers are simultaneously consuming media. So they may be watching traditional TV and they're on their iPad, they're on their phone. Do you ever implement like, hey, we know this spot's going to run at 9.05 and at the same time we're going to do a, a, a buy a search on Google so when they go to look for that product that, they're, that that's the first on the top of the, the list? So we always recommend uh, when you are running television in more of a mass schedule or in a tentpole event, for example, making sure that budgets 
are being raised around those different channels as well. Search in particular is a huge driver. TV and search going hand in hand, typically with Facebook in the mix too, just to have that mix there. Um, I think you do a disservice to your brand if you're not amping up in those areas, especially when you have pulses of media or spikes like that. And wherever possible, leveraging retargeting channels, you know, whether you're retargeting somebody on an OTT device, on their phone, wherever they may be, always making sure that all of those things are in play so that we can apply sequential messaging as well when it makes sense to really drive that impression home a little further. We, uh, we use a lot of that simultaneous screening, if you will, for a lot of our scrappy underdog brands where if you're making a push against a certain context or tent pole, you're, you know, it's not just your video mix, but also layering that with Facebook and things like that. On a, on a similar side for some of the ACR pieces, competitive conquesting, if you're a, an underdog brand again and you're being outspent five to one in the video space, we can use that to you know, be very targeted you know, to make sure at least we're at an equitable share of voice with a, a competitor that's outspending us to you know, at least try to be as efficient as possible that way. Yeah, tent, tent pull moments for us for sure. Uh, campaign announcements, debates, conventions, things like that, that's where we're uh, definitely matching those up. Hi guys, it's Josh Martin from Performix. I just had a question on cost. Um, it's interesting, the panel is where does it sit, but uh, you know, does it work? And do you guys have concerns of the cost premiums associated with these new environments? I know in the world of direct response, if you didn't have a different rate card and a lower cost, television or cable television wouldn't work in the same capacity. So I just wanted your thoughts on that. So from a performance standpoint, definitely, I think there are some interesting strategies that you can leverage. So, you know, there's the DRTV buying approach, of course, where you have those preemptive models. Those same preemptive models are in play at other large OTT organizations. They don't overtly advertise that necessarily. Um, and then the uh, because again it, it is that preemptive approach and a lot of people do want to buy that guaranteed schedule. However, as you start to work more and more with these large organizations that have those things in play, you start to learn where those sellout periods are going to be and then you make sure that they're on the plan during the periods where you know they're not going to be sold out, where you know you're not going to be preempted and you're going to pay a quarter of the price. So that's how we tend to handle the pricing challenge. Media companies salivate at the election season, so uh, <laughs> I think the premium rates that I look at are probably a little different than uh, what others would ever find acceptable. Uh, and so ours is, you know, it's relative, but we are looking at them across media companies, platforms, et cetera, in real time to try and see if we can find efficiencies. Uh, but at the end of the day, we got to spend everything by uh, election day, and so we run out of options, and we, we definitely do make inefficient buys along the way. The, the investment piece is actually a, a pretty interesting story from what we do, because our, our video center of excellence has a good sense of where the CPMs are falling um, for different channels, let's say, and then we'll collab the strategy or planning team will collaborate with them to understand generally speaking, what the effective CPM is, right? So if you have a, a TV buy where you can estimate 50% of your audience is there, well, that's double the CPM. Whereas a, if you have an online video plan, it's, let's call it 90% targeted. You can start to figure out what the best balance is, and then we'll actually take those estimated effective CPMs and optimize that way. Um, so that a lot of times if something is at first blush a high CPM from a demo perspective, let's say that effective targeted CPM could be much more efficient based on the, uh, the focus. Well, it's a funny business where you still have um, direct response rate cards at stations. Uh, I didn't even realize that still existed, but <laughs> then you have the other side of the world of programmatic optimization. I'm surprised that TV hasn't swung over to that yet, but. Well, um, I think some so are trying, you know, I mean, some are trying to get into the programmatic television space. I think. It's finally now getting a bit better, but I think unfortunately, previously, you were getting a lot of local remnant inventory that you wouldn't necessarily want to pay a premium for. So that's why I don't yeah. think it worked too well. 
Well, I think the panel's almost over, but we should have gotten into brand safety, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to, I want to ask a, f a final question that stupidly opens up another big can of worms, but maybe we can do this in the round table, is uh, we haven't addressed brand in, in, in housing and how that impacts your organization, especially when it comes to the fact that it's, it adds another layer of complication to all of this cross-channel planning is what happens when the brand is deciding to bring some of this in-house. You've, you've got traditional brands that are trying to bring in pieces of it. Then you've also got this new generation of direct-to-consumer brands that are bringing enormous digital online expertise but little experience with TV. I'm curious if any of you have any experience with working with this phenomenon of in-housing and how that changes, mixes up this whole structure. We like to say at our agency, every day is a new day. Um, because every client that we work with across our portfolio, we are involved in a different way. So for one client in particular, we would be their brand media AOR. For another client, we're handling everything across the funnel from the branded media right down to paid search. So every engagement that we have with our clients is very different. So we're dealing with those unique challenges every single day. So I think it's, it's a good education for us as well as our clients. We're learning what's working and what's not working. And really, this year, we're focusing a lot more around the collaboration, whether it's data sharing, performance sharing, those kinds of things. That's really an important and a critical step for us as we're seeing more and more of this. And like I said earlier, the, the data insights and analytics teams that are being built internally at these organizations and, and getting that sharing and collaboration. We still, at least my brands, we work a lot with the media directors in-house, so there's not a full agency team there. Um, I would say the principle would probably be similar, as long as you're aligning on what the strategic goals are for the clients um, and how you're going to get there or where you're strategically placing your bets, uh, in, academically how you're approaching the video plan. As long as those are set and then you have rules of the road, um, you can certainly play nice with an in-house agency. I, I think it's like search or pure play digital, which is the long tail brands will embrace that in-house first, and when they get big enough, they'll hire Havas. So. But as Adrian's point is, is interesting, it almost sounds as if the brand's in-housing actually helps you organize a little bit, because in some sense, they're taking the lead, and you better understand what structure you need to put in place to deal with each of the brands. For sure, especially when they have a strong performance marketing team internally that might handle all of their programmatic and their search and those more performance-driven campaigns, they need to understand how our upper funnel media is driving those activities, and we need to understand how it's performing on their end so that we can inform how we're buying from up here as well. So it is a, a synergistic relationship, and it is getting, a, getting stronger, I think, as opposed to this backing off. And we're going to take this up at the roundtable on the same topic. Joe, as always, thank you very much. Thank Panel, you. great start. Thank you. Thank you.